have to get used to this because I, I'm guessing some words don't come out now. The frequency changes, right? So it's just going down a set. OK, so start, start off the timer. The agenda for this specific session is that I'm going to talk about how integration is changing, how the integration landscape is changing. And this is basically based on the uh, experience that we've had with uh, customers, right? Uh, experience that we've had working with the large organizations like large fintechs, et cetera, large telcos, uh, as well as what we see in the industry from, from basically customers talking to us, new leads coming in, so on and so forth. Right? So, I'll, so I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, so I'll then talk about some of the topics that are being discussed in the integration space today. Right? So integration personas and this concept of uh, citizen integrators, right? Uh, API-driven integration, so how does really API management fit into this? Whether, it's, whether these two are mutually exclusive or whether API management basically uh, provides a facade on top of integration. And I think Gartner talks about this concept of uh, API integration as well, right? Uh, so there's this concept of integration microservices, so let's talk about that what our roadmap around that is as well. And then, of course, we have enterprise integration patterns. So I'll, I'll briefly touch upon that. And uh, uh, Anjana would go into details there. So finally, we'll talk about a reference architecture for a hybrid integration platform. So that's, that's a buzzword today. So let's, let's address that. Um, first and foremost, foremost, can you understand what I'm saying? Yes, good, all right. OK, uh, so, so this slide basically talks about the, the fact that integration is still around 60% or more of a digital product. So this, the, the concept is changing a bit. You have proponents of microservices who come to us and say that integration is not required anymore, uh, or an ESB is not required anymore. Uh, basically, now everything's API driven, and you have end-to-end -end services. right? So again, 60% is a number that we, we assume. Uh, but we also see that it's still like 60% or more. And integration comes in different flavors. It's not just a single central ESB where you do your transformations, your mediations, orchestrations. There are different flavors of integration. And that is how this basically comes to the 60% or more number. right? So I'll, I'll talk about that. But we also see that integration can be a source of competitive advantage as well. Right? So, so integration, of course, typical integration is within the organization. You integrate your cloud systems. You integrate your backend systems. You compose various services into a, a combined service. Right? But then integration would fit at different levels as well. So let's, we'll talk about that as well. So this is a, a slide that I basically borrowed from Gartner, one of the uh, analyst reports. So I'll just spend some time on this slide. Uh, unfortunately, is there a, there's no point on that, right? So I'll just point it out. But so it's interesting. So so the the blue bar there is uh, oh there's a point. All right. All right. Okay. So green doesn't work on white, I guess. <laughs> okay, that's okay. All right. So even close by no. So the blue bar there is basically the environment today. And this is based on uh, Gartner's survey of around 300 enterprises. right? And the green bar there is basically what they uh, predict would happen in three years. Right? So, so you can see the first part is uh, integration is moving from companies using third party integrators, outside organizations to do the integration for them, to an in-house model. So, so the use of third party integrators is dropping. So that's one. Uh, the establishing of a integration compliance center or integration competency center or a center of excellence for integration within the organization is increasing, right? So, so in the past, yes, we've had organizations who have a special ESB team or special integration team. But that concept is actually increasing, as per Gartner. Lines of business basically handling their own integrations or lines of business teams is constant, right? So there's no change there. This concept of citizen integrators, and I'll, I'll talk about what that is. 
is basically increasing, according to Gartner. Uh, the concept of a federated center of excellence, so the same center of excellence, but you federate that governance model, so each business unit basically handles their own integration center of excellence. So that is increasing, which is quite interesting. Uh, chaos in the integration market is increasing, obviously, yeah. Uh, and, and then others don't know. So, so, but what we gain from this, or what we extract from this, is one, that there is this concept of citizens integrators that is basically increasing. People predict that there'll be more, uh, or there'll be less integration specialists in the field. There'll be more ad hoc integrators, or there'll be more people who just come in and do, try to do integration. Right? So, so we'll look at that. Uh, this concept of center, centers of excellence for integration is increasing. So that means the, the concept of integration is increasing. The ability to handle integration within your organization, using your organizational skill sets, is increasing. Right? So it's, it's not something that you just outsource to some other organization or outsource to a vendor, but uh, as an organization, as organizations move more towards software development, the integration centers of excellence is basically increasing within an organization. So the, we've seen lots of presentations out there where we talk about digital transformation. Right? So one of the theories of digital transformation is that every company is becoming a software development company. Right? So even if you take a, a fintech, if you take a retail, if you take a government, everyone's basically moving into software development which means you're moving away from just outsourcing stuff to other organizations to do it for you, and you're basically building the skill set so that you build it yourselves. Right? So, so that's one major part of uh, digital transformation. So as part of that, theoretically, you also need to invest in integration. So let's use that slide to basically come up with some uh, evolution strategies for integration. Right? So I've just jotted down some. And we'll be talking about a few of them in detail. So the first is, of course, you need to support newer digital business initiatives. So the organization or the CIO might come and say, we need to be a cloud-first organization. We need to be a mobile-driven organization. Uh, we need to be, get onto the API economy. And so, so that affects integration and how that works. There are newer deployment models. Right? So you're looking at uh, cloud deployments, right? so basically deployments on the cloud. If you can see that, can you read that? Yeah, so, okay. uh, so there is basically newer programming models. right? So you have the concept of integration microservices. And how does this ESB really fit into that? So we'll look at that. You have newer ownership models. right? So you have uh, systems that would be owned by multiple vendors, not just a single vendor. You'll be, you had systems that are owned by multiple cloud vendors, or, or basically deployed on multiple clouds. Uh, there'll be systems that are basically owned by your own organization. Either you build it yourself or you maintain it yourself. There are newer constituents or newer uh, personas. So there are newer se there's a newer set of people who are expected to use this integration platform. And so we look at that. There are newer endpoints. So we usually talk about, OK, so you have multiple backend systems, multiple legacy systems. You need to integrate them. Now you have things and streams. So from the IoT world, you have basically a, a billion devices, and you need to integrate devices on the fly as they come in in different ways. Right? That's integration. You have streams of data or events coming in. So if you, if you looked at uh, Tyler's and Paul's keynotes yesterday, they spoke about APIs, events, and streams. Right? But at the end of the day, these are all integration problems. You should be able to integrate these components and it's not good enough for you to say, OK, there's a new device. There's a new device type. That means it's a new device driver. So that means I basically need to write a, a Java class, compile it, deploy it onto a server, and restart the whole server. Right? That's not an acceptable mechanism anymore. So you need to have these hot deployment models. You need to have mechanisms where you can very quickly create a, a, a mapping between like a proprietary format and a canonical data model and just deploy that onto some integration platform. Right? Uh, there are newer use cases like stream processing, there is, and then there's integration everywhere. So we talk about APIs, we talk about IoT, but then there's an integration part of uh, every single area. So I'll, I'll talk about that. 
OK, so, so let's go into some details there. So one of the uh, areas is basically this, this new addition of, a, of a different types of skill sets or different types of personas. Right? So this, again, comes from different analysts, Gartner's views, Forrester's views, and the various predictions. But we also see, or at least many of our customers who talk to us, also basically use some of these terminologies. So it's not just theory. So, so we do have customers who come to us and say, do you support uh, integration specialists versus ad hoc integration versus citizen integration? Right? Or they want to build a solution that basically uh, caters to citizen integrators. So I'll start at the bottom. So what this diagram says is that it's an inverted pyramid. So you have fewer integration specialists or integrator specialists within the organization who have a very high integration skill set. Right? So, so they would know uh, like the various integration languages. They would know the actual technologies. If you need to build, let's say, a B2B integration, uh, let's say if you need to do an integration between Salesforce and a certain platform, or if you need to build something between a cloud platform or your proprietary system and your integration platform. That would be done by integration specialists. So if you are taking an integration platform from a vendor, this integration specialist might be the vendor themselves. So the vendor's job then is to basically build connectors. So there will be a connector for Salesforce. There will be a connector for some other system. And then if you decide that you want to tweak a certain connector and basically have it support your own proprietary protocol, you would basically get your integration specialist to build a connector as well. Right? So so these are the actual key resources within the organization who build that framework out for you, either the vendor or basically uh, resources within your own organization as well. But it's going to be a small subset of key resources. The next level is the, the use case that would be more used most often in most typical organizations, right? so ad hoc integrators. So if you take an organization which has, let's say, a, a large integration platform, you would have different business units who would have their own integration requirements. So let's say uh, there's a fintech which has, let's say, four different business units. And each business unit has uh, their own mainframe system or backend services. And each business unit has its own validation, transformation requirements. So the ad hoc integrators would then basically use the various connectors, use the various templates, and build their own integration logic there and deploy it within their own business unit. Or if it's a central platform, they'll be deployed in a tenant of their own or, or some partition. Right? So the ad hoc, ad hoc integrators here uh, mostly do like business unit projects. They can be the API developers as well in today's world, because APIs might require some level of integration. But it's, it's a partitioned group of people who would work for each uh, business unit. And you don't need the same skill sets as the integration specialist. You then have the citizen integrators. So there are some vendors, some ESB vendors out there who specialize in citizen integration specifically. Uh, so the idea here is that you should have a business user who needs to come in. And let's say the business user's requirement is to quickly get some data off Salesforce and put it into uh, their SAP system, for instance. And they don't want to go and tell uh, an integration specialist to do this for them. They want to basically be able to go in and do something. Or let's say you are uh, on, you're using Google Apps for your organization, and you have a spreadsheet, and you basically need to extract certain values from the spreadsheet and push them into Salesforce, or vice versa. Right? So the citizen integrator needs predefined templates, predefined connectors, uh, predefined scenarios that they can use. You need a, a UI that's very visual. Uh, the citizen integrator shouldn't really see the code at all, right? shouldn't see details at all should be able to just drag and drop stuff in an intuitive way and get your integration going. Right? It might be a complex integration, but the citizen integrator shouldn't see that. So we, we see many organizations looking for these various parts. Uh, there's one last part, which is digital integrators, which is a bit of a futuristic thing. Where So there's two parts to this. So one is there are the IoT devices who need to basically come in dynamically, uh, integrate themselves if required. Right, so if they have a proprietary uh, format, and if they have certain specifications, then if you self-sign up or if you self-register a device, the integration platform should be smart enough to 
uh, onboard them onto the system. Right? So you look at the specification, you look at the canonical model, and you do the mapping. Right? So, so there, are, there are systems like data mappers uh, to do this manually, but then this is automating that data mapper part. Uh, Gartner also predicts that there will be a certain level of AI into, uh, in middleware as well. Right? So the AI component would come into this data mapper as well. Right? So, so that's, that's what Gartner predicts. And they also predict with the uh, large amount of devices, this area is going to be huge. Right? But at the moment, most, most of our customers are really talking about the three areas below digital integration. So that's one area. So that's basically that the fact that there are different types of users now, and the expectation of integration is changing. The second area is that API-driven integration is increasing. Uh, a couple of years back, either, either Gartner or Forrester came up with this terminal, terminology of API integration. Right? And then, of course, our customers turned around and asked, started asking us, do you support API integration? Right? So it's a, it's a buzzword-driven domain out there. Right? So our response to that is, in the past, we had an integration layer, we had an API layer, and we support basically what is called a facade pattern, an API facade pattern, where you do all of your heavy lifting of integration in your integration layer. And in the API layer, you just expose managed APIs. So you handle your throttling, your rate limiting, uh, your security, et cetera, at the API layer. So in this diagram, you have the integration layer, you have your backend services, and you have your API layer. But then certain organizations didn't want this because uh, so unless you have a large amount of integration logic, and unless you have complex integration, you don't want to really deploy a separate integration platform. So you might want to do simple integration at the API layer as well. Right? So our response to that was that you basically have integration capabilities within the API management layer as well. So I'm talking about WSO2 here. But so if you need to do, like let's say, an XML to JSON, or if you need to do some kind of header validation, you can basically do it in the API management layer as well, right? because the same underlying framework is used, and there are certain capabilities there. So our response to customers was that it is a trade-off. If you want, if you think that you're not affecting your API layer by doing integration there, and uh, the integration is simple enough, go ahead and do it in the API layer. But if it is a complex set of integration, <coughs> it's better to have this separation of concerns, the architectural pattern and basically do it in the integration layer and just expose APIs. So the flexibility is there for customers. But at the end of the day, integration might often live with an API layer. So the reason for that is basically this concept of an API marketplace. Right? So, so let's say you have four different business units who build out their own set of services. So let's say you have uh, 500 services across the four different business units. Now you need the ability for cross-business unit discovery. Right? Someone from another business unit who have their own applications should be able to come and discover the services that this business unit has written. It makes no sense to basically go and recreate every service. And at the same time, it might also be a bottleneck if you expect a central integration governance body to take care of all of the business units as well. Right? It is possible if the organization is small, but as the organization grows larger, you might look for federated models. So in that aspect, API management comes into play here. So if you expose these services as APIs, and then you have an API marketplace, so what, which means you have a, a developer portal where all of the APIs are exposed. Each API has its own set of documentation, SDKs, uh, metadata, so on and so forth. You have the ability to test the APIs. You have the ability to track who is using those APIs. Uh, you can have backward compatibility in the services, so on and so forth. So by building a marketplace internally, you can then basically pr uh, promote this, uh, the creativity between developers. You can reduce duplication of uh, APIs and services, so on and so forth. Right? So, so we now often see as a trend that integration is coupled with API management. Right? So APIs, so it can be an API first strategy where you first define the set of APIs. Then you decide what the integration logic is and what the services are. Or you can come from a bottom-up approach where your service basically uh, is created by different teams. Uh, that may, maybe spits out a swagger already as part of the service. Swagger then goes into the API 
management system automatically and creates automated APIs at the API layer. Right? So you don't do a two-step process. You do a single process, but it's all automated. Right? So, so API management is, is a key component, and we, we see that increasing uh, in most of our new leads coming in. So then the third concept is this concept of integration everywhere. So this diagram here uh, is, a, is a vague attempt to summarize what a digital organization would look like. Right? So I'll just go into this. So, so this is maybe 70, 80% of the organizations. Maybe some organizations don't fit into this. So you have your core services, your, your data, your services, your systems. These services can be macro services. They can be microservices. It doesn't matter, right? So you, can, you have your legacy systems, your SaaS products, your cloud providers, etc. Around this, typically, you would have an integration platform. Uh, five years ago, that would always, nearly always be an ESB, right? So there'll be an ESB, either per business unit or for the whole enterprise. And you would basically wire your services through the ESB. Right? Uh, around that, typically, you'd have an API layer. So the API uh, gets exposed to either internal customers or external customers, right? so different types of stakeholders. Identity and access management comes around that. So it can be within these layers as well, and these layers can interchange. But once you start exposing APIs, you need to start looking at how secure those APIs are. So, so by, by default, you'd use Auth2, OpenID Connect, the various protocols. Uh, if the organizations need to do single sign-on, you'd do, like, say, SAML uh, or some OpenID Connect exchange that token for OAuth2, and then call APIs, et cetera, right? So identity and access management would come outside the API management layer, but at the same time, you can have internal security as well, like your SOAP uh, services security, like W security, uh, your, your integration with NTLM, Kerberos, if you're in a Windows environment, et cetera, right? And then finally, outside, you would have a layer for analytics. So we put this outside because analytics is required for your integration services, for your API services, for your identity services, so on and so forth. But then these layers start interchanging. And since the topic is integration, integration would basically move to different layers as well. Right? So, so you can see there's a bit of IoT there as well. Again, IoT might be a combination of different technologies, right? Mostly integration, a little bit of uh, analytics, and then APIs, identity, security, so on and so forth. So I'll give you one example here. So uh, API composition is integration of APIs. So when you talk about composition, uh, so let's take the finance fintech example again. So let's say you have four different business units, each who have a number of APIs. Now, so so let's say you each unit has like five different APIs, and you have a central marketplace which exposes like twenty different APIs. So if someone says that, OK, I need to combine these three APIs and basically integrate them and start using them as a single API. So they would talk to the organization. The organization would talk to the integration team. And that team would uh, basically mash up these APIs and create a new API and expose that. But there comes the requirement where the APIs need to be self-service. So you see the APIs on a developer portal. So let's say uh, you are an organization like uh, StubHub. Right? So StubHub is one of our API customers. So let's say StubHub exposes 40 different APIs on its developer portal. And the partners of StubHub, or, or the, the application developers, can come to the portal, sign up, and see those APIs. But let's say one of those uh, partners is a mobile application. And StubHub has exposed, let's say, a login API, uh, a get customer information API, and a get uh, ticket for regions API, three APIs. So the mobile application wants to cut down on uh, mobile traffic or bandwidth. So they, want, they say that they basically want to mash up login API and the guest, get custom API, because they don't want to, to, to do two different calls. So the application developer now, who doesn't have access to any of the underlying services, needs to do an integration of those APIs themselves. So the consumer of the API should be able to do integration at, or composition of the APIs in a self-service manner at the developer portal, for instance. Right? So, so that's, that's somewhere between an ad hoc integrator and a citizen integrator. But it gives power where, where the application developer can do some integration in a sandbox. 
expose a small API there, and then start using that API. Right? So in API Manager 3.0, uh, the next version of the API Manager, so we are building this capability where in the developer portal, you have the ability to compose and create a new API. Right? So it's a consumer-driven composition, whereas the market offers producer-driven composition today. Right? So it's a com consumer-driven self-service composition. But to do that, you need to be able to have a language which can do integration very easily. You need to have a very intuitive UI, which, which basically shows you all the APIs. Uh, you need to have patterns, and like enterprise integration patterns and connectors, which allows you to basically uh, do these integrations. And the integration should be lightweight enough so that you can deploy it in a small container within a sandbox just for your organization. Right? So if you go one step further, if, it, if this is a full marketplace, the, the producer, the consumer now, should be able to expose this API as a new API to different organizations. Right? So uh, one example is, so we, have, we worked with uh, Telco. Uh, I spoke about a case study yesterday, actually, uh, in, in Asia Pacific, uh, the Asiata Group, who built a marketplace. So, so they, they exposed uh, integration APIs, they exposed uh, like SMS APIs, uh, location-based services APIs, etc. So telco APIs. So there was one organization who came and used those, uh, they used a, a location-based API, they used the identity API, and they also used a Facebook API and created a new API and exposed that, which provides the status of any given customer. Right? So, so what happens is you, you get the identity from the telco API, you go to Facebook, get the profile information, and if anyone wants to see what mood this user is in today, right? so if a retail organization wants to see, uh, okay, so let's say the retail organization wants to see that uh, Sam is getting engaged next week, for instance, and you can basically do a targeted marketing around that. So that's a specific API that an organization created and exposed to its, uh, its customers, but they are not the core entity that who created the uh, base APIs in the first place, right? So it's a full real marketplace example. So integration would be key in that area as well. So the final two slides, pattern-driven integration is, is a key component, right? So you need to now have various patterns, right? So, so if you're doing citizen integration or if you're doing ad hoc integration, it's key that you have reusable patterns which encompass best practices which, uh, and which provides ease of reuse. Right. So patterns can be enterprise integration patterns. Right. So uh, Gregor Hope has listed a set of enterprise integration patterns. So the ESB provides a catalog for that today. And Ballerina will also provide a catalog for that. Uh, patterns can be connectors. Right. Patterns can be templates or scenarios that are reusable. So for instance, uh, integrating Salesforce to Google Spreadsheets, instant, for instance. That can be a reusable template. So patterns vary in the complexity, and that, of course, determines who can actually use the pattern, whether it's a citizen integrator versus whether it's an ad hoc integrator. And then finally, this concept of an integration microservice. Right? So, so you know in terms of integration that there is this concept of a large ESB. Right? Microservice proponents basically come to us and say, that will not work anymore because I need to now build services and I need to basically expose the services uh, to the external world in an autonomous manner. Right? So, so if I build my service and if I wait for a central integration platform to do that, then that defeats the purpose because you need someone else like in a gold mode to come and say, OK, I'm going to now integrate your service and expose it as an API. Right? So, so integration microservice means that you should be able to write your services and expose them externally. But one part the integration community, sorry, the microservice community doesn't address is that there is still a requirement for integration. There is still a need to connect to a SaaS, uh, SaaS provider. There's still a need to do transformation. There's still a need to compose various uh, integration microservices into a, a consumable format called a mini service. Gartner talks about a mini service. So the idea is that we now can break down this integration platform have the same concepts as microservices, but allow people to deploy their integration microservices very, very quickly. Right? So, so let's say if you have two services there, right? and if you, need, if you have the need to do some level of uh, API composition or service composition, you very quickly launch a container which can do this. 
do your integration there, use your enterprise integration patterns, and then deploy that as yet another microservice in the microservice world. So in the microservice world, they also say that you can use multi-vendor technologies. You can use any technology you want as, a, as long as the APIs are consistent. Right? So, so all this means is you might have a Jaxar service, you might have a Spring Boot service, you might have a ballerina-based service there, and you expose a mini service to the outside world. Right? So this is where ballerina fits in. So ballerina would basically be the next generation of integration. And I'm not going to talk about ballerina because there's enough and more uh, sessions out there. But most organizations would look at a two-pronged approach. It's not either or. It's not mutually exclusive. So there would always be a requirement for integration or central governed platform for at least some time. There might be a requirement for much more smaller components to come in, and that's basically the integration microservices. And basically, these two can live in harmony next to each other. And that's the vision we have for customers moving into the integration microservices space. Unless you are one of those very rare organizations who are starting with a fully greenfield project uh, and basically saying that you are building a solution or project from scratch, which is rare. Most organizations already have services, already have enterprise service buses, and you want to move into integrate the microservice space as well. Right? So a model would mostly be an approach where you have a hybrid model, where you'd have the ESB, where you have integration microservices, and you then eventually gradually move across. So this, uh, so I'm out of time, so two more minutes. So basically, this diagram or this architecture, we'll share this, shows you how this fits in. So you have your core microservices layer there. You basically have your integration microservices that, that can basically fit in here. If you have a central integration platform, that can also fit in somewhere there. And then, of course, you eventually have an API gateway that exposes the various uh, APIs. So, so you have the... Uh, so the, that, that basically maps out how all these components uh, match together. Right? And we'll share the slides. So, All right, so let me switch to the, the final slide, which is a hybrid integration platform. So, so then Gartner, Forrester, and these multiple organizations talk about a hybrid integration platform. So what they say here, so this is basically a concept, but what they say is that integration platforms are not something you, you basically take and say, hey, now we have an integration platform. We need to now figure out how to use this. Moreover, what you really need to do is to figure out what your service requirements are, what your integration requirements are, what your current environment is, and how you need to bring in either one vendor's technology or multiple vendor technologies, or basically something you built in-house into this space. But there are different layers. There are the templates that are required, so connectors, enterprise integration patterns. Regardless of what technology you're using, that is important. There are the different types of users, and you need to figure out as an organization which types of users you are planning to support. There are the different types of integrations. So we, we, talk, we, we know about B2B integrations, uh, B2C integrations, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, data integration is still a key component. You need to support different kinds of communication protocols, styles, uh, formats, and especially in the IoT world, that's quite important. And then the whole stack or sets of stacks should be able to be deployed. You should be able to deploy them on a public cloud, or you should be able to use a SaaS version, a private cloud, on containers if required, uh, as on VMs, so on and so forth. Right. So, so basically, so that's that's basically the the spiel I had today. Right. So, we we spoke about the changing integration landscape. Uh, we basically spoke about various factors that is changing in integration. Uh, so including integration microservices, API-driven integration, the different types of users, and what uh, basically some of the analysts out there propose as a hybrid integration platform. Right? So, but integration is key, and that's, that's basically the bottom line here. So we will ha be having two sessions which focus on the uh, integration platform we have today, the ESP. As I mentioned, we have the next-gen platform also coming out, and the basis of that is Ballerina, but there will be uh, uh, in ESB type of component, which would be a micro integration microservice component that is being built around that. But what you need to understand is that the end decision is yours. It might be a hybrid approach you would go in. It might not be an either or approach, which is mutually exclusive. Right. So I hope you enjoy the next two sessions and the rest of the day. And uh, we'll, we'll take questions at the end. So let me introduce um, the next speaker, so Anjana Fernando, who will be talking about 
going beyond the ESB, uh, basically talking about some of the patterns beyond the ESB. Anjana is uh, Anjana Fernando is basically an associate director and architect. Uh, he is basically part of the uh, ballerina team. So he's a spy that we got over from the ballerina team to come and talk about the ESB, right? So we didn't want everyone just going there. Uh, so Anjana was also part of the big data analytics team, and he was uh, responsible for building the analytics platform, the streaming analytics platform as well. Uh, so if you do have a chance, we have a, uh, a we can showcase Anjana's bag. So Anjana is quite busy, so his bag is like in tatters. Uh, so he hasn't had time to actually buy the bag, but we'll just showcase it back there as well. So Anjana. Over to you. Thanks.